Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about hypertension and exercise recommendations for someone with hypertension. Um, so first off, what is it? It is high blood pressure. Uh, so it's elevation of systemic arterial blood pressure. Um, so when we measure blood pressure, you get the top number and the bottom number. So it is systolic blood pressure over diastolic blood pressure. So systolic blood pressure is the pressure in the arteries while the ventricles of the heart are contracting to eject blood out into the arterial system. Diastolic blood pressure is the pressure in the arteries while the heart is resting and it's filling again with blood before it contracts again to eject that blood. Um, so systolic while the heart's contracting is the top number over diastolic that's the bottom number that's the pressure while pressure while the heart is filling. Um, so generally speaking 120 over 80 is good blood pressure. Um, even less than that, 110 over 70 might be more optimal, uh, but if you're 120 over 80 or under, that is considered normal um, until it might get too low. That could be another problem, but um, most of us are not at that point. Most of us are at risk of high blood pressure as opposed to low blood pressure. Um, and then it's considered elevated if it's between 120 and 129, but your diastolic is still 80 or less. And then hypertension stage one, where uh, systolic is 130 over 130 to 139 over 80 to 89, so a little bit elevated on both. And then it's hypertension stage two if it is 140 or more over 90 or more. Okay, so there are a lot of different variables that factor into our blood pressure. So if there's something going wrong with any of these many variables, it could lead to high blood pressure. We also are able to influence many of these variables through exercise. So exercise is an excellent intervention for improving blood pressure. Um, so the boxes in red, those are the three factors that directly affect blood pressure. So our total volume of blood in the system, our cardiac output, so that's the quantity of blood that the heart pumps per minute, and vascular resistance. That's the amount of resistance of the body to the flow of blood through the cardiovascular system. So the blue boxes are the variables that affect our cardiac output. So heart rate and stroke volume. Stroke volume is the amount of blood that's ejected from the heart per beat. So heart rate, how many beats per minute, and stroke volume, how much blood per beat. If we multiply the two, that gives us how much blood we eject per minute, and that's the cardiac output. Um, so we multiply the two for cardiac output. So generally speaking, as one goes up, the other goes down to keep cardiac output the same. So with exercise, we can increase the stroke volume, meaning how much blood we pump per beat. And if we're pumping more blood per beat, then it doesn't have to beat as often to be able to distribute the same amount of blood throughout the body. So stroke volume increases in response to exercise because our heart becomes more efficient, which is what lowers resting heart rate in response is because we're pumping more blood um, per beat, doesn't have to beat as often. Um, so the factors that feed into stroke volume, those are in green. So the degree of stretch of the heart when it fills, so how big does it fill and stretch? Cause then it recoils and helps push that blood out. Uh, the force of the cardiac muscle fiber contraction. So how much force does the, um, do the fibers and the ventricles um, produce when they contract, which is uh, partly hormonally regulated. So like if there's epinephrine acting on the heart, it will cause it to contract with greater force, which will cause a greater stroke volume. Um, and then the pressure required to eject the blood from the ventricles so the blood doesn't leave the ventricles until the pressure in the ventricles exceeds the pressure in the aorta. So the higher blood pressure is, the more pressure the ventricles have to um, generate to open the valve and allow the blood to be ejected. The longer it takes to generate that pressure, 
the less of the blood is going to leave the ventricles. So it's like, it's like if the door is going to close at the same time, no matter what, the earlier the door opens, the more blood can get out. And the later the door opens, the less blood can get out. So the more pressure the ventricles have to build before the door opens, meaning the valve, then the later it's going to open and the less blood will be ejected. So the ejection fraction, meaning the fraction of blood in the ventricles that's ejected is smaller and smaller when there's higher and higher blood pressure. Okay, so lower blood pressure will mean higher stroke volume because the valves open sooner and so more quantity of blood is able to exit the heart with each beat. And then vascular resistance, again, the resistance to blood flow through the cardiovascular system is affected by the ones in purple. So the size of the lumen, so that would be like the state of vasoconstriction or dilation throughout the body. Um, so more dilation, more vasodilation will mean a larger lumen space inside of the vessel. So then there's less resistance to the flow of blood and more vasoconstriction will mean more resistance. Um, blood viscosity. So thinner blood is going to have less resistance than thicker blood, more viscous blood. It will have more friction between the blood and the blood vessel walls. So like dehydration, will mean thicker, more viscous blood because there isn't enough water to dilute all of the solutes in the blood. So it becomes more viscous. And so dehydration will increase blood pressure because it is increasing vascular resistance. And then finally, total blood vessel length. The more miles of blood vessels we have in the body, the more resistance there is to the flow of blood. Um, so when we gain more mass, whether that be muscle mass or fat mass, we also are increasing in, by several miles, by many miles of blood vessels to accommodate those new pounds um, of whatever kind of tissue that we have gained. So we are increasing our vascular resistance with more body mass. Um, and so that's one of the, the issues with gaining fat. So becoming overweight or obese, one of the issues is that um, just automatically you are increasing vascular resistance because you're increasing the number of miles that the blood has to travel through and therefore the vascular resistance and therefore blood pressure. Okay, so causes of hypertension. As I just described, obesity can be one of them because you are increasing uh, the vascular resistance through increased uh, blood vessel length, uh, physical inactivity, um, too much salt or saturated fat in the diet, um, excessive alcohol consumption, which causes dehydration because it interferes with antidiuretic hormone. So you pee out water that your body wants to keep. Um, but it's causing dehydration because you can't keep that water without antidiuretic hormone. So it makes the blood more viscous, which causes more friction in the blood vessels and increases the vascular resistance. Um, heavy caffeine intake, tobacco use, use of certain illicit drugs, um, use of certain medications, all can have the side effect of increasing hypertension. Um, so effects of hypertension, why is this a problem? Um, so hypertension is nicknamed the silent killer, and that's because it is dangerous and leads to all kinds of really serious problems, um, but we don't know when we have hypertension. We don't feel it until something worse happens. So until the hypertension is severe enough that it causes a bigger problem, then we feel the, the symptoms and, and the effects of that problem. Um, but until then, um, it's quietly happening in the body and we don't really feel the consequences of it. Um, and that's why every doctor you go to, regardless, you don't have to go to a cardiologist to get your blood pressure taken. They take it everywhere you go. Any kind of doctor, they take your blood pressure when you go because they are screening for high blood pressure because it is quiet and it sneaks up. Um, so it's important to screen for it uh, before it leads and you start having actual symptoms. 
Um, so the problem with high blood pressure is that pressure is pounding away inside the blood vessels. So it's damaging the endothelium, the inner lining of the blood vessels. Um, and it can be damaging other structures that those blood vessels are leading to. Um, and so it ultimately can lead to heart disease, stroke, and renal failure, and the many complications and things that can go with each of those three. Okay, so treatment for high blood pressure. So there are several different drugs that are used for high blood pressure. Um, so one is diuretics. Uh, diuretic is a drug that makes you lose water. Um, so the point of a diuretic in the case of high blood pressure is that it would lower your total blood volume, because if you're losing water, then you're going to have a lower volume of blood. Um, and so then that would lower blood pressure. Um, beta blockers are a class of drugs who their job is to block the receptors on the heart that receive epinephrine. So like if you go into a fight or flight state, um, or anywhere in between, it's not black or white, but when your body is secreting epinephrine and it's acting on the heart to increase heart rate and force of contraction, which both would increase blood pressure, beta blockers block the epinephrine from reaching those receptors so that it can't have that effect. Um, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, those are ACE inhibitors, um, they prevent production of angiotensin II so it goes through a whole series, the angiotensin. And so there are a whole bunch of processes to get to angiotensin II, which is the active hormone that increases blood pressure. So ACE converting, or sorry, ACE inhibitors, um, they block the conversion of angiotensin I, which is not the active form, it's like the precursor into angiotensin II. So it blocks that conversion so that you don't have angiotensin II circulating, which causes an increase in blood pressure. Um, angiotensin receptor blockers, um, it's a class of medications where you did convert and you do have angiotensin II, but here we're blocking the receptors for the angiotensin II, so it has the same effect of, of blocking the high, the increasing blood pressure. Um, and then dietary modifications for blood pressure. Um, there are different diets that can be effective for different people, like the DASH diet, um, which is heavily plant-based and focuses on lean proteins and uh, fruits and veggies and is overall low in fat. Um, they recommend lower sodium. Um, that's because when we eat more sodium, we retain water to balance that sodium and more water means greater volume of blood and greater volume of blood means higher blood pressure. So for some people, lowering sodium will, will help with blood pressure. Um, and then limiting alcohol consumption. Again, it makes your blood more viscous um, because you're dehydrated. Um, and there are other effects on the cardiovascular system, but in general, limiting alcohol consumption to one or two drinks a day um, in somebody who was previously drinking more than that will help with hypertension. And then exercise is very important and helps with most of those variables on that uh, little flowchart we saw a minute ago. Um, so as little as one day a week of exercise reduces all cause mortality um, and people with hypertension. Okay, so exercise recommendations. Um, so the idea is to have daily activity totaling at least 150 minutes a week, but as much as possible is better. Um, doing cardio up to seven days a week um, and fluctuate, you know, change up the intensity. If you're doing cardio every single day, there should be easier, moderate, and more difficult days so that you can rest and, and recover on the easier days. Um, but you wanna aim for at least 150 minutes a week of moderate activity, or at least 75 minutes a week of vigorous activity or some combination of the two. Um, and you wanna aim to burn at least 1,000 calories a week through your cardio exercise. And then in addition, two or three days of resistance training, following the standard strength training guidelines, um, and then flexibility training. It's kind of neither here nor there when it comes to hypertension, but it's recommended. 
Okay, so I want to finish here by just going over some precautions about certain um, hypertensive medications that people might be on, um, because you do need to consider these when you are training somebody who is on beta blockers or ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. So beta blockers, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, they are blocking the receptors on the heart that, that receive epinephrine. So it's blocking the heart from the stimulus that causes the heart to um, pump faster, so increase heart rate, and pump with a greater uh, strength of contraction, which is going to interfere with the ability for stroke volume to increase and the ability for heart rate to increase, which means cardiac output will not be able to increase. So the total amount of blood pumped per minute will not be able to increase beyond a certain threshold in somebody who's on beta blockers. So this is a very serious consideration. Um, when somebody on beta blockers is exercising, they will have to keep their heart rate below a certain threshold because, and keep their level of exertion below a certain threshold, because let's say maybe that's 150 um, beats per minute. Let's just say that that's the, the heart rate that is their threshold. Now, if they start working harder and harder and harder, they continue to exert and their level of intensity is increasing. In somebody not on beta blockers, their cardiac output would continue to increase with that intensity to supply their body with the blood that they need while they're exercising. But with beta blockers, they are stopped. They are limited at that threshold. So if exertion continues to increase and cardiac output can't continue to increase because of the beta blockers, you can end up with a very serious problem because they are not going to be able to deliver the required blood to all of the places in the body that needs it. Um, so it could be a really serious medical emergency um, if that person is overexerting um, for where the, the beta blockers are limiting them. So for that person, you want to get um, guidelines from their doctor. So you wanna ask the person to give you uh, guidelines that they get from their doctor about what heart rate they should be limited at. And then they need to wear a heart rate monitor and limit themselves to that heart rate. So they, their problem is overexertion. They cannot overexert and you have to be really diligent about that and not let them overexert. Um, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers um, actually are, are pretty favorable for exercise and performance. Um, they seem to improve sympathetic heart rate response, meaning like the heart responds really well to epinephrine um, when they're taking those medications, like more so than somebody who's not taking them. Um, and it does appear to slow the decline in muscle mass, strength, and walking speed in older adults. Um, so there are favorable effects of those when it comes to exercise and maintaining muscle mass. But the precaution you need to take here is if somebody just started them, um, because they are lowering blood pressure and the person hasn't adjusted to that yet, right, when they first start taking them, be aware that it will cause lightheadedness and dizziness. So factor that in, consider that when you're programming for them and, and make sure that you're not doing anything that would be dangerous if they got dizzy or lost their balance. Uh, but that goes away over a little bit of time as they adjust to the new medication and they adjust to the change in their blood pressure, that goes away. And then their workouts tend to be um, better than they would have been without that medication in somebody who's hypertensive, uh, of course. All right, well, that's all I have for you in this video. Thanks so much for watching.